Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Mr. Lindley. Dynamics. One would call it a quite a forceful topic, fundamentally based around one man's three laws. For more on this, we go to our field correspondent, JJ. Thanks, Mr. Lindley. I'm live on location here in Massachusetts, in front of the building where fig dudes were once made. It has also been brought to my attention that Fig Newton's not actually named after Sir Isaac Newton. His laws were quite important, though, especially that one that reminds me of a delicious, meaty treat. Hopefully he'll worry about that real soon. Back to you. I wonder if that meaty treat is in a loaf-type shape. Let's now get into the full review of this dynamic topic. Mr. Lindley? Hey, thanks guys! We're here with Dynamics! What a forceful topic! <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Hope there's not too much uh, friction as we discuss this. <laughs> Forces. These are really the, the two fundamental equations that we had worked with, right? So, well, let's get a little bit in to forces, right? I'll leave the equations there because we're going to need them eventually anyway. And, and where did we start? We started this unit with one foundational, fundamental thing that we did over and over and over again. The good old FBD, or free body diagram. Remember with an FBD is right, you're making a dot, and then off of that dot you are drawing any and all the forces that are acting. So just quick example, you know, if I had a block on a table, and let's say there's a rope pulling it this way, and let's say this is a very, very rough table. Right, I'm going to put a dotted line here in my diagram to indicate my ground. I'm going to put downward would be the force of gravity. Upward, we will have the normal force, right? And then this way, we would have the force of tension. And then back this way, we would have the force of friction. Remember, we're identifying those forces off of names that we would commonly call them, how would we refer to them, uh, and, and yeah. So then... From this, what we really talked about was that, that guy Newton, and, and he did in fact have three laws. And if you remember them, uh, Newton's first law, what we had talked about it being, was the law of inertia. Okay. Being that an object in motion stays in motion, an object rest stays at rest. So if I were to you know, interact with something and push on it, it's going to continue doing whatever it was doing until it has a reason not to do that anymore. So you know, if I have something, I can, I can push it. Okay. And if there is no friction, it would in theory move forever until something were to push against it and stop it uh, to cause it to do something else. Now, Newton's second law, right, commonly referred to as N2L, uh, we talk about this as being F net, and we had referred to this uh, affectionately as MA MILOF! MA MILOF! Come here, babe. Come. My dog's here. Come. You want me to pet you? Come. And we're back. So Newton's second law, right? This is where if I apply a net force on something, I'm going to get its motion to change. It's going to accelerate. And that could be speed up or slow down, depending on our scenario. And then the last one we talked about, which, you know, frequently comes up, is third law. And we uh, refer to this a lot as action reaction okay so if i were to push on something it would push back on me now third law is one of those things we always have to sort of keep in our mind because if we have an object having any interaction with anything else we're going to get a third law thing something else to keep in, in in mind with this right so if we just go back to that simple example the the normal force here in this example Right. Another way to say that would be uh, ground on block or table on block, whatever there ends up being. But that the block then also has to push down on the table or the floor. Now, these forces have to be equal in magnitude and opposite direction. But what happens to those objects does not have to be equivalent. And that fundamentally has to do with second law. And something we had done a bit was take these two and put them together. And a great example of that was bug windshield. So if I have a windshield and I have a bug that strikes that windshield, something very clearly happens uh, different between the bug and the windshield. And the big reason for that is although the force of the bug on the windshield right, would be equivalent to the force of the windshield on the bug, the issue is the mass of the bug is very, very tiny. 
and the mass of the windshield is enormous, especially since it's connected to the car. And what that does then is that makes the acceleration that the windshield experience is very tiny and the acceleration the bug experience is quite large and that causes some unfortunate things for our bug friend. So we had you know combined second and third law like that. So always keep third law in mind. You never know uh, when it's going to be useful when you're going to need it. Now, what we uh, started with when we did this unit, the you know first thing to do uh, is equilibrium equations. Now, when would you do equilibrium equations? If it was an equilibrium. And uh, our, our common phrase uh, for us was left equals right and up equals down. So if we go back to that example we had uh, a few moments ago, let's imagine that that system was in equilibrium. I would have my left and right forces being equal. Uh, so I would write that as the force of friction being equal to the force of tension. And I would have my up and down forces also being equal. So I'd have my upward normal force and my downward uh, force of gravity also being equivalent. Now this only works if we're getting an equilibrium scenario, which is not always obviously, but again, equilibrium defined as no net force, which could be two cases, constant velocity or at rest, right? And at rest is just a special case of constant velocity. Isn't that right? That's right. That's right. So let's keep rolling with this. The next thing we had done was accelerated motion. And, and the trick we did for this is we set all our problems up like this. We said, uh, you know, F net. Uh, and we had said uh, it is going to be accelerating forces minus resistive forces, right? And what this helped us to do was try to understand different scenarios and, and try to uh, have an easy systematic way to calculate them. So let's go back to that original example. Let's imagine there's not enough friction to hold it in equilibrium. So if I was going to set that up, then uh, that would be, we would have F net, right? And in that example, it would be tension minus the force of friction because force of friction is my resistive thing. And the next thing we always did beneath this is we said F net, and this is mom, Milos! Mom! Mom! I don't think she can hear me. Probably because she's not in this county. Anyway, we can then take these two and equate them to each other and use that to solve whatever my problem was. Now, one special case that we had done with this was, you know, what if we have something uh, that is a system? So what if I have block one, right? I have some sort of pulley and then I have block two. And let's imagine the mass of block two is significantly larger than the mass of block one. In a case like this, if I was gonna set up my FBDs, right? FBD for, for block one, I would have an upward normal force. I would have a downward force of gravity and I would have forced this way, which would be tension. And let's say that this, uh, this table is super, super smooth. For this other one, I'm gonna have a, a downward force that I'm gonna label should label that FG1, so I'll label this FG2, and then I'll have an upward force here of tension. Now, if we wanted to, what we could do is we could do uh, two sets of equations here, right? And and if we, you know, want to write them out, uh, this would be like Fn would be equal to FG1, great. And then F net 1 would be equal to tension. And over here, the only equation that I would have would be F net 1. 2 and this would be fg2 minus tension and again we're saying this system is going to move like this because i told you that the mass of the second one is significantly larger than the first so we could do this you know we, we could keep rolling with this we could keep going and and try to solve this but what's easier is what we had done was we were say what if we thought about it as a system who <laughs> like a body system what is this biology <laughs> not unlike systems in other areas. When we use the word system, systems a collected uh, group of things that are all sort of act and work together. So that's what we're going to do. If we treat this like a system now, so if I'm going to treat this, I'm going to write this now as F net sys. And now we have to think, what force is accelerating my system? What's going to accelerate my system? Well, in this example, it would be uh, Fg2. And what holds my system back? In this example, nothing. 
If, if you look, you know, there's nothing here on the back side of this FBD to resist the motion of the system. So then, you know, I would I would take this a step further and then it'd be F net sys and, and my meatloaf. But now it's M sys. So when I do this, this is actually going to be M1 plus M2 times A. Now, obviously, if you had something like friction, uh, that would go there, right? Uh, or if you had another rope, like in, in problems like the trifecta, right? We would tack that on uh, there. Great. Now, um, you know, the other sort of big portion to this was uh, ramps, right? And, and how we address, you know, something going on with, with a ramp. Now, the weird thing here that we did was we took our, our axes and we actually tilted our head. And I think that, you know, inclines need their, uh, an entire video. But just to briefly go over this, the one big trick that we did was we said that gravity always acts downward, right? So we always have, you know, FG acting downward. But then the trick that we did was we were to draw two components of gravity with our head tilted. Uh, and we called this one FGY and we would call this one FGX. And reminder that whatever this angle is here, theta is the same angle theta there. And FGX, if you make the triangles this way, is always FG sine theta, or another way to write that would be MG sine theta, and then FGY would be FG cosine theta, or MG cosine theta. And I think, you know, ramps uh, need their entire video um, because there's a lot of other concepts we can bring in. Uh, so look forward to that. Now, forces is foundational as we move into energy and as we move in into momentum and impulse. So it's really foundational unit. It's important to understand to make those FBDs, right, to draw them uh, and be able to understand the concepts. Great. Smash that like and subscribe. And until next time, thanks for watching. Hang on a second, you're not done with me quite yet. But forgot the most abrasive topic this unit. Friction. It was so abrasive it slipped my mind. <laughs> Frictional forces, right? They're a resistive force. And the way we're calculating them, we can see in our, our lovely equations is, is mu fn. Right, and if we remember what these things are, uh, mu is defined as the coefficient of friction. Coefficient of friction is basically a measure of the microscopic irregularity interactions between two surfaces. So although surfaces look smooth, they're certainly not, there are microscopic irregularities. And this mu thing is a measure of how the microscopic irregularities, say, <laughs> say that eight times fast, microscopic irregularities, <laughs> It's how the microscopic irregularities of two surfaces interact with each other. So mu is always about two surfaces. So it's asphalt and rubber, for instance, right? Or, or waxed skis on snows, a little throwback. Now we have two styles of friction that we talk about and, and one is static and the other is kinetic. And static meaning not moving and kinetic meaning moving. If we think about the microscopic irregularity, static friction is when the irregularities are locked together and they, they have a, a much harder time moving. And kinetic is more about the rubbing of, of the irregularities. Now static connection, static, uh, st now, static friction um, as a maximum value is actually bigger. And that's why this equation is actually written with an inequality. Uh, so if we were to write this, we would, I would actually write this as, as static friction uh, is a range um, where this here represents the maximum value for static friction. Okay? But, but kinetic friction right, is just equivalent to this. If we were to make a graph of pulling something, so if we were to pull something over time, uh, between force and, and, and time here, uh, we would actually see this graph peak and then flatten out. And that peak right there would be maximum static friction. And then this flat part here would actually be the kinetic friction. So, you know, we talk about these different frictions, different scenarios. So it depends if something is sliding, right, along the ground, it would be kinetic friction. If something is rolling, right, ooh, that seems like a, that's like foreshadowing almost for like a future thing. 
uh, then that has to be static friction because the surface is actually gripping. So, so, you know, this is how we're calculating uh, friction now. Most times mu is, is given to us or, um, you know, it, we're using it as a variable in the problem anyway. Big thing to remember here, though, is that static friction is a range of values. Kinetic friction is, is one uh, constant value. And static friction, the maximum value is bigger. Uh, simple reminder here for ourselves is that it's always harder to start the motion of something than it is to keep um, something moving. Now! You can smash that like and subscribe because now we're done with dynamics. Look forward for the next unit review video. And until next time.